Begin self-publishing episode 108, Fiction Editing with Louise Harmby. Interested in self-publishing but don't know where to start? Want to get your book onto Amazon? Want to hold your paperback book in your hands? Learn how on the Begin Self-Publishing podcast with your host, Tim Lewis. In this episode of the show, I talk to a fiction editor, Louise Harmbury, who is a long-established editor of fiction books and has worked with quite a few self-publishers. Now, while there's a certain amount of overlap with the interview with Denise Cowell that I had a few weeks ago, actually, I think there's enough difference, just in the, also in the way that Louise works and the way that Denise works, to make this also a very interesting interview for anybody to listen to. And certainly it has more relevance to people who write fiction than Denise's interview and vice versa. So now over to the interview. Hi, Louise. Welcome to the show. Hi, Tim. Thanks for having me here. Okay. What are the differences between the various kinds of book editing? So the first thing I'd say is that the terminology is a bit tangled when it comes to book editing. Editors use terms like copy editing and line editing to mean different things. And one of the problems is geography, but that's only part of the story. To be honest, there's variance even within countries. And so when an editor and an author are talking about working together, it's really essential that they're both clear about what's expected and what's being offered. I've got my own set of definitions and they're shared by many, but not all of my fiction editing colleagues. So I just wanted to make that clear while we're talking. So the first up is developmental editing. And just to confuse things, it's sometimes called content editing or substantive editing or structural editing. And I like to think of this as the shaping stage. It's big picture or macro work that looks at the novel as a whole. And so when that kind of work's been done, we're looking at things like whether the chapters and scenes are ordered in a way that helps the reader move through the story. We're looking at whether the plot is engaging and makes sense, whether the characters are authentic and if the protagonist and the antagonist are drawn up in such a way that they hold the book together. The editor is also considering character point of view. Is it consistent so that the reader isn't unintentionally head hopping? Also, is the pace of the story comfortable? Does it provide an engaging reading experience? And last but not least is the narrative flow. Is it coherent? Does it drive the novel forwards? Does it build tension and engagement and then arc down so that the reader feels satisfied when they actually come to the end? And I should also mention that some editors do offer scaled down developmental packages. So things like mini structural edits, manuscript evaluations or critiques, plot accelerators, there's all sorts of names for stuff. But there's lots of options out there for the author on a budget. And I always recommend that authors take advantage of these if they can, because they're absolutely brilliant ways for a writer to develop their novel craft. The next two stages are line editing and copy editing. And here we're moving away from the macro, big picture stuff that I've just talked about and into sentence level. So line editing is the smoothing stage. And here we're looking to ensure that sentences flow well and that they reflect the author's intention regarding mood and action and tension. And when I let line edit, I'm looking out for things like authentic phrasing, repetition, too much stage direction, clear dialogue expression, grammar and syntax problems, elegant sentence flow and overall readability. And the really key thing at this stage is respecting not just the author's voice, but the individual character's voices throughout. When you're line editing, you absolutely have to be flexible. Otherwise, the editing can just turn into butchery. And that's not a good thing. <laughs> Copy editing is the correcting stage. And here we're looking out for correct and consistent grammar, spelling, punctuation, and also things like indentation and spacing, the actual sort of layout of the text. And again, I'd say that when you're fiction copy editing, there's a lot of care required. Pedantry can completely destroy tension. And when an editor starts fixating on imposing listing or serial commas because some style guide or other says that's the way it should be, it's easy to lose sight of the feel of a scene. So I guess overall, I'd say that fiction editing needs a a keen eye, but a gentle hand. And I tend to line and copy edit at the same time because it's almost impossible to do one well without the other. And the final stage is quality control. And now we're into the world of proofreading. And at this stage, most of the hard graphs should have been done. Proofreaders look to pick up anything missed during the previous stages of editing. And ideally, there should be minimal intervention. It really is a final tidy up. 
And what, one thing I should mention is that before ebooks existed, proofreaders didn't amend the raw text. Believe it or not, we actually worked on paper, that old fashioned thing. And we were checking design pages prior to publication. Whereas these days, m- most proofreaders are annotating PDF page proofs or they're working on, when they're working on print books, or they're actually amending raw text files for ebooks. So those are the four stages that I break down my fiction editing work into. You're more the sort of line and yeah. whatever the other type was. <laughs> I've forgotten. What, what yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sentence level work. So I do line editing, copy editing, and proofreading. If developmental work is asked for, I refer elsewhere. Okay. How important is it to work with a fiction editor who understands the genre of your book? I think gen- genre is really important because an editor needs to work with context in mind. And although authors aren't looking to create carbon copies of what already exists within their genre, I think there are conventions that an editor needs to be aware of and and that readers feel comfortable with. I think a good simple example would be the way an editor might approach line editing and copy editing with crime fiction. So, for example, it's not unusual for a crime fiction narrative to be broken up into quite short, choppy sentences, perhaps to arouse terror or anxiety or disgust in the reader. And if the author's struggling to arouse those emotions, then the editor who's familiar with that genre and enjoys reading it and has studied how those emotions can be controlled by, say, the length of sentence or the use of hard punctuation, that editor's going to be a much better fit. And genre also comes into play with language, though. And I once worked with a a lovely historical fiction novel author. She'd done a lovely job, but the primary flaw was that she'd come a little bit unstuck with modernity characters in that book had a tendency to flip into this kind of contemporary slang and it robbed them of their quintessential Victorianness. <laughs> so that was something that I think in that sense, you really need to be fixating quite clearly on what genre you're working with. Another really good example is, is young adult fiction. Beginner or emerging authors sometimes struggle to find the right voice when they're putting themselves into the heads of teenagers. And I know this all too well because I've got a 13-year-old daughter. And just a few weeks ago, I was trying to do my best impression of her and her pals. And she said to me, Mum, honestly, only old people say awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, when did awesome become an old word, an old people's word? And, but it just shows that when you're editing young adult fiction, you have to be ready to check everything because it's not only age but geography that can term, determine who says what. And so I guess my advice would be to anyone thinking about moving into fiction editing is have an open mind, actually read the genres you want to specialize in, study how those <laughs> those books are shaped, how the so-called rules that you were taught 20 years ago bent and molded to drive authenticity. Be prepared, not necessarily to break those rules, but to apply them differently. Okay. How do you determine how much it will cost to actually edit a book? So. If I've never worked with the author before, I absolutely need to see a sample of a few chapters. I read these and then actually edit, say, a couple of thousand words. And that gives me a sense of what the problems are and whether I can solve them and how long it's going to take to solve them. And then it's just a case of doing the maths, really. When I said whether I can solve them, I mean whether the type of editing that I'm being hired for is what the book actually needs. Um, You asked me earlier what kind of editing I specialized in. Just to reiterate that, I'm a sentence level editor, so I'm either line or copy editing or proofreading. And if it's clear from that sample that there are structural problems or or, or that the authors requested what I consider to be developmental work, then I'll refer them elsewhere. I won't even quote. It's not fair on them and I'm not going to do a good job on it. Okay. So that didn't really answer the question in terms of uh, what would be the average figure if you're... Oh, you want want some money. You want some costs. I want some hard cash numbers here. Okay. Well... (laughs) It really varies. I mean, different editors charge different things, but I'm usually looking to earn around £32 an hour. And when to break it down in terms of price per thousand words, depending on what level of intervention is needed, if it's proofreading, so I'm working on a, a file that's been extensively and professionally edited beforehand, I'd be looking at around probably a, around £10 per thousand words. If I'm copy editing and the file is in good shape. So it, if I'm copy editing and line editing and the, the author's quite experienced and there isn't a lot of intervention, we might be looking at 12 to 14 pounds per thousand words. If 
the line editing is extensive because the author's a great storyteller, but their actual sentence level writing skills need a lot of help, then it could be more. So I think that, you know, even sort of 16 to 20 pounds per thousand words, it really does depend on on each individual sample. It's done on a project by project basis. But they those give you some ballpark figures. So they can people can work out how good a rice they are by how much you're charging them per thousand words. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, I mean, in in that I think that again shows that the importance of using taking your book through those different stages, those different levels of editing. If you're going straight into, if you hire someone to go to proofread for you, and that's the only professional editing pass, it's going to take that person ages to get through your book because actually they have to do so much more than what you've hired them for. And it is the case that you pay for what you get. Okay. So what generally is the biggest misconception that authors have about editors? That's a really great question, Tim. (laughs) I think it really depends on how experienced the author is. It's heartening to see actually how many self-publishers are really on the ball about the different levels of editing and how long these take and what they might therefore cost. But there are still a lot of beginner authors out there who think that you write the book, you read it through a couple of times, and then you hire a proofreader to get it ready for publication. Basically, proofreading means sort it all out. And it's a real shock to some of them when you tell them that their book's not ready for that, that you're likely to be making thousands and thousands of changes and that you won't be able to do it at the same pace as you leisure read. And it's not going to cost 150 quid and it's going to take 50 hours. And the thing is, good editing does take time. And unless you're a highly accomplished and experienced writer and a brilliant self-editor, investing in only a proofread will likely be a waste of your money. It's a bit like buying cheap shampoo. It doesn't lather up properly, so you have to use more, and then your hair's not clean anyway. And frankly, you'd have been better off investing something of higher quality in the first place, because even the money you have spent has just been washed down the plug hole. (laughs) The other big issue that I come across is attitudes towards or expectations of perfection and what's possible in one past. I hinted at this a, a few moments ago. Editors are human. Whatever stage you are in the process, there's a chance that however high you aim the bar, you're not going to get over it every time. Probably the best way to illustrate this is a little story about something that happened to me a few years ago. I was commissioned by an author for a so-called proofread, and I've been told that the book had been edited beforehand. Because I was less experienced than I am now, I didn't do my due diligence, and it came back to bite me really hard. I made over 16,000 corrections in that book. I drew up over 100 queries. Some of the problems were micro things like spelling, punctuation and grammar issues. But two of the chapters were repeated in their entirety in different places in the book. The protagonist's wife had one of her children twice. And that's no mean feat. (laughs) Another child completely dropped out of the story. The protagonist's brother's name changed three times. The universities attended and the dates he was there chopped and changed a lot. And four characters in the book had the same first name, which was really confusing. To be honest, the job was a nightmare. But by the time I'd completed the editing and hit the send button, I was I was really pleased with myself. <laughs> now, here's the thing. I thought the author would be delighted with the work I'd done, and he'd certainly got his money's worth. And at first he was pleased. <laughs> and then a few months later, he emailed me to tell me that his wife had gone through my edited file and found 40 things I'd missed. And he made it really clear how disappointed he was. And I was gutted. I was really upset. The thing is, Tim, I'd found 16,000 problems and fixed them. 16,000. And I'd raised 100 queries so that he could fix them. Just on the correction issue alone, I'd achieved a hit rate of over 99%. And you can't ask more than that from an editor. You really can't. But because he had unrealistic expectations and because I hadn't communicated what's possible beforehand, we both came out of the whole experience feeling upset. And that was a huge learning experience for me. So the one thing I do now is I always ask my authors to read a page on my website called Will It Be Perfect? And that way, we both come to the table with a mutual understanding of what's possible. And it's important that I do want to make it clear that I completely respect the fact that a lot of indie authors have a budget and I absolutely support their right to make what are, I know, really difficult decisions about what levels of editing to commission from professionals and what to do themselves. But I also need them to know that my name's not Gandalf. (laughs) Editing's not magic and it can't be done well and quickly and cheaply. Something has to give. So that's something that's really, really important, I think, for all editors and authors when they're working together to establish right at the outset. And my one final thing that I'd say is authors are often surprised that I'm not available right now. A lot of professional editors get 
booked up months in advance. So I always recommend that authors start their search well ahead of time. I tend to be booked up six months in advance, but my friend Lisa, a book coach, she's currently booked up for the next 15 months. So it does show how important it is not to leave to the last minute. So those are my top tips for sort of clearing up misunderstandings between authors and editors at that process. Okay. So we kind of talked from the uh, the editor's view of like uh, how authors are getting it wrong. What is the easiest way to tell if a fiction editor or proofreader is actually any good, really? Well, I think when it comes to fiction editing, it's less about good and more about good fit. The thing is, if you put it, 10 line or copy editors in a room and give them the same piece of text, you'll end up with 10 different samples. The likelihood is we'll all handle the literal errors in the same way, but the way we might smooth sentences will be different. It's really down to interpretation to a degree, and it's subjective. Something that makes fiction editing stand out, and I, I guess the same would apply to narrative nonfiction too, and that is that the editor has to be emotionally responsive. You need to feel the story, get under the author's skin so you can mimic them. And my mantra is always, it's your book, your story, your characters. And my job is to smooth and polish so that all of that remains intact. I want an author to feel almost like I wasn't there. The reader shouldn't be able to see the line between where I intervened and where I didn't. So it's about being responsive, but also about being invisible. And the author's response to those sample edits is also going to be subjective. So he or she might think, oh, that editor really gets me, really understands what I'm trying to do here. And when that happens, you've got a good fit. And I think that's where the great, a really great author-editor relationship starts. When both of you feel it's good, you start to build trust. Because one of the things that clients most often tell me is how nervous they are about hiring an editor. I understand that. Fiction authors often use their own experiences to tell their stories. So every scene of grief or sexual arousal or fear or anxiety might well be based on something that they've actually experienced. Or it's something that they certainly thought about or fantasized about. And now they're going to hand that intimacy over to a stranger and pay for the privilege of having it critiqued and amended. It's a massive deal. And the good fit factor is about making sure that that journey is an enjoyable one. The author should feel excited about working with the editor, like the editor's got their back, that they're a safe harbor. So my advice to every author is ask for a sample, not just from one editor, but from several. And then think about how do those sample edits make you feel? Is your voice intact? Which editor gets you? Which one makes you feel excited about being edited? If the editing makes you feel uncomfortable, that's fine. It doesn't mean the editor's no good. It just means they're not the right fit for you at this time and on this book. Okay. Comes to, uh, I'm going to ask you a question that wasn't one that I gave you before the interview, but uh, you'll have to think on your feet here. But if somebody's hired an editor for the first book in, say, a series of eight books, yeah, like some long series. Is it a good idea to just stick with the same editor to try and maintain, as you say, that same voice? Or is there really any issue with switching editors midstream in a sort of a series of books? I think that if you've been happy and comfortable with the work that the editor did in the initial books, I think you should stick with them. Going back to that subjectivity issue and that feel issue, you're going to get a lack of cohesion, potentially. This wouldn't be the case at proofreading stage, certainly, because that's just the final tidy up. But at line and copy editing stage, where the editor might be making punctuation changes or suggesting recast for sentences, going back to the beginning means that you've you've lost everything that the editor has learned from the early books has just been lost. I work with quite a few series authors, and it's a journey for me too. I've come to know those characters. I've come to understand how they think and the kind of things they'd say and the kind of things they wouldn't say. And that enables me to improve my editing in that series as the series goes on. So the, it's not just the author moving forward with his or her writing. I'm moving forward with them on that journey as the editor. And so if you start chopping and changing editors in the middle of a series, there is a risk that you will lose that cohesion. Having said that, if you're not happy with the work the editor's done, then you absolutely must change. Okay. What can an author do to ensure that their editor can do a good job with their book? So I talked about samples just now and evaluating those. So it's, it's also important to have that conversation I mentioned earlier about what you want. I'd say because of the tangled terminology issue, try not to focus too much on that. Instead, explain what your problems are and what kind of help you think you need. If you're not sure, that's no problem. Just ask the editor. A good fiction editor should be able to explain the different levels of editing to the author. 
which ones they offer, which ones they recommend. And a decent fiction editor should also be prepared to decline working with you if they don't think they've got the skills to help you. Another thing that they can do is perhaps take a look at what the editors worked on before. Have they edited books in similar genre, for example? What training have they done is another thing to consider. And I do think that training is really important because editors need to understand publishing industry conventions if they're going to help indie authors prepare their books for market. But with fiction editing, that element of emotional responsiveness that I mentioned earlier is something I'm not sure that can be taught him. I think that some people just have a natural bent towards editing fiction responsibly, whereas other people are more probably suited to nonfiction, which I do think is an art form all of its own. So training is important. It's something for the author to consider, but it's not the be all and end all. Look at their testimonials too, not just from self-publishers, but from the mainstream publishing industry. I'm not saying portfolios and testimonials are a guarantee, but I think they give an author a glimpse of the editor's history and that you should be able to get a sense of whether what's written on the tin is the same as actually what's in the tin, if that makes sense. Okay. I kind of asked this question in a previous interview with Denise, but I'm not some people I had some people email me saying, Oh, well that's for non fiction. I don't write non fiction, so I'm not listening to that episode. Mm-hmm. But what <laughs> is the if somebody is like a new fiction indie author, but they don't really know where to look to find an editor, where 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 can they find a group of editors to actually send them a thousand words to so they can start this process? Where where's the best place for them to look to? fine fiction editors for their genre? So I think the best place to start is probably their National Editorial Society, because at least some editorial societies, including the Society for Editors and Proofreaders, which I'm a member of, in order to advertise in that society's directory, you have to have met certain conditions. You have to have done a certain amount of training. You have to have professional references. And so there's a level of quality control there. And if you go to a professional editorial society, you're, you're immediately dealing with a group of editors who have identified themselves in the market as professionals. You can certainly use Google. There's nothing wrong with that. I get a lot of referrals from Google. But the thing about using Google as a search engine is that ultimately, that's often who you find there is often determined by how good a marketer they are, not necessarily by how good a editor they are. So Google will give you thousands and thousands of results, but it, will, it won't necessarily tell you what you need to know in terms of making evaluations about the quality of that editing. So use it, but use it in conjunction with other search formats like professional society directories. Okay. So in the UK, that's a society for editors and proofreaders. What about the US? In the US, you've got the Editorial Freelancers Association. In Canada, you've got Editors Canada. In Australia, there's the Institute of Professional Editors. Let me think. Ireland, you've got the Association of Professional Editors and Indexers. Northern Ireland, you've got EPANI, which is the Editors and Proofreaders of Northern Ireland. I could go on. There's <laughs> yes. actually a, there's a list actually on my website, which I will tell you about or later, or you can put a link into, that has a list to every single national editorial society in the world. Okay. How about that? Yeah. Would that help? Yes, that would definitely help. Yeah. Give me that link after the show and I'll put it in the show notes at beginselfpublishing.com. So uh, I think that just about wraps up everything, at least from a low level with uh, fiction book editing. How can people find out about Louise Harmby and your editing services? So they can go to louisehalmbyproofreader.com. I've got a dedicated self-publishers page there and that has lots of free goodies on it, all about making the indie author's life easier. So I'd recommend they stop by there for first. I'm always happy to answer questions too. If so if they just want an, want an initial chat about editing or self-publishing, I'll do my very best to help. Okay. Well, thanks for being on the show today, Louise. Thanks for having me, Tim. I really, really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please stop by iTunes and rate and leave a review. This helps make the show more visible. For free resources, show notes, and other helpful content, join the community at beginselfpublishing.com. 